There's a little bit of excitement here. I wonder why. <laughs> Good evening. I am Dr. Sharon Burnett, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Edward Waters University, the state of Florida's destination institution of emerging eminence. On behalf of our distinguished president and chief executive officer, Dr. A. Zachary Faison, Jr., I am delighted to welcome you to the fifth iteration of Edward Waters University President's Distinguished Lecture Series for 22-23, featuring none other than Ms. Nia Long, actress and motivational speaker. <clears throat> Our lecture series is referred to by two words, stay woke. We believe this is a timely expression intended to demonstrate a deliberate focus on the continuous expansion and development of the overall knowledge, ba overall knowledge base of Edward Waters University's entire academic community. The purpose of the series is to also provide a vehicle through which the EWU community can interface intentionally with culturally biased issues and to promote socially conscious and socially responsible activism in the millennial and post-millennial era. <clears throat> Equally as important, the series intends to create a platform for the entire EWU community to hear and engage with accomplished and distinguished speakers to provoke meaningful discussion, relative reflective and critical thinking, and provide enriching insight and illumination into the critical issues of our time. It is our hope that the full collection of distinguished speakers that will visit our academic community over the forthcoming years will allow the EWU community to indeed stay woke by engaging the views, ideas, and ideals expressed by the national thought leaders, authors, entertainers, activists, advocates, and opinion shapers who will be featured in the series. We hope that you leave tonight inspired, motivated, and maybe even a little agitated to expand your personal footprint as a socially responsible leader an architect of positive change here in the greater Jacksonville area and beyond. Now, I invite to the platform, Ms. Roshana Newton, Ms. Edward Waters University, to introduce Ms. Long. Tonight, our guest is none other than stunning pop cultural icon and Hollywood's leading lady. She is a not one, not two, but a three-time NAACP award winner featured in motion pictures, including The Best Man, The Best Man Holiday, Big Mama's House, You People, and Missing, to name a few. Long made her film debut in Boys in the Hood and continued on to star in Friday alongside Ice Cube and Chris Tucker, as well as Love Jones, which won the prestigious Audience Award at Sundance Films. On the small screen, Long's portrayal of Officer Sasha Monroe on NBC's hit crime drama, Third Watch, awarded her two NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Actress in a Drama Series. Long's other TV accomplishments include The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Boston Legal, Judging Amy, and Big Shots. Long also voiced Roberta in the first season of the Fox hit The Cleveland Show. In addition to her film and TV work, Long's passion lies in serving her community. With her family roots planted in Trinidad, Grenada, and Barbados, her long-term goals are to connect women in the U.S. to those of the islands and to mentor young ladies to regain their self-esteem. 
Additionally, Long lends her support to Black Girls Rock, an organization that promotes the arts for young women of color and encourages dialogue on the ways women of color are portrayed in the media. Long loves to cook organic, farmers market fresh meals, adding a twist of her Trinidadian heritage. When she's not juggling between her career and motherhood, she enjoys staying active by doing Pilates, boxing, hiking, and horseback riding. She also finds pleasure in traveling and experiencing different cultures throughout the world. Tonight, let's give her a warm welcome as she experiences the culture of the jewel of Jacksonville, better known as the destination institution of emerging eminence, the Edward Waters University. It, it is my tremendous honor to introduce to some and present to others our EWU Tiger Scholar and Residence for the evening, thespian, Miss Nia Long. Thank you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. How are we, Tiger family? Wonderful, wonderful. I want to thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I invite you this evening to sit back, relax, prepare yourself for a wonderful evening of conversation with our EWU scholar in residence for the evening, Miss Nia. Long. Usually, our Stay Woke President's Distinguished Lecture Series is obviously hosted by our President, Dr. A. Zachary Faison Jr., and I obviously am not him. <laughs> He is traveling on university business and cannot be here with us tonight. And so he has decided that he thought it most fitting in the month of March, Women's History Month, to allow the women of Edward Waters to rule the place tonight. <laughs> So on behalf of the first president and CEO of Edward Waters University, it is my esteemed honor to welcome you all to EWU and to say, I'm Ticey Faison. Let's relax. Let's have a wonderful evening of conversation. Now, anybody who knows me knows I love a good chat, but I don't like to chat alone. So... <laughs> So I I figured that if we would chat, I'd ask a few friends to assist me just a wee bit. So I thought that I might, um, I don't know, in honor of Women's History Month, I might say, let's invite the women, Edward Waters University scholars. So to my left and to my right, you see EWU scholars. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. And directly next to me, I have Ms. Ashley Connor, who serves as our interim executive director for student success and engagement. She will assist in moderating. And I thought, Hmm, I need but one more, one more. So we dug deep and thought, who? The women, hmm. And so we pondered and we said, you know what? It was just not so long ago that Edward Waters University appointed the 10th Associate Vice President and Director for Kids for Intercollegiate Athletics at EWU, Miss Ivana Rich. Thank you. 
a fun history note for Women's History Month. She serves as the first, the first, Edward Waters University loves to do things first. <laughs> she serves as the first female director of intercollegiate athletics for over 156 years. Yesterday, Dr. Rich served as our speaker for the Honors Day convocation, and as she spoke, she gave words to her 18-year-old self to inspire our students. And one of the key takeaways I took from her message was, I can do hard things. That's what she said. She said over and over again to this very room that I can do hard things. So, Dr. Rich, I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to toss the first question of the evening to Dr. Rich to do a hard thing and get us going. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, let's stay along the lines of um, first. And so, should I call you Miss Long? Oh, call me Nia. We're all friends here today. <laughs> I love that everyone here says ma'am and sir and miss. If I could only get my children to do that. <laughs> but today you can call me Nia. We're on a first name basis. We're good. So Nia, as a woman in the arts, a leading actress and a movie superstar, <laughs> what is the important, importance of being a first? A first? Yes. Ooh. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for having me this evening. I love visiting new places, especially when I see faces in this room that look like me. Mm. I hope that God puts on my heart the things that you need to know from me. And feel free to ask me anything. I'm super open. Um, a first. Okay. So... When I started in the industry, there was a handful of us that was working. It was me, Halle Berry, Regina King, um, and Jada Pinkett Smith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love those women. I think we've all served our, our purpose in different ways. Um, but in that group, I was the real brown skin girl. And I'm not saying they're not brown skin, but what I'm saying is I was looked at as the brown skin girl. I did not look mixed. I did not look biracial. I looked like a black woman. And I'm talking about the way I was judged, not what I believe. Well, I do believe it a little bit, but my point is it was harder for me because during that time, the more white you looked, the more opportunities you were given. And that was a very difficult road to travel. And so I don't know what I am the first at, but I know that in my family, I was the first to become famous and to have a career that was very public and to, and I didn't go to college. Like, that's the one thing I actually regret that I didn't finish school. Um, because the doors of welcome <laughs> are right here at Edward Waters University at 1658 Kings Road. We'd love to have that conversation. <laughs> we can, we can definitely have that conversation. I, so I am the first in my family, and I'm also the first in my family not to graduate from college. Now, I say that. All of you in here, finish. Do what you came here to do. There, I just got lucky. Would you say that one more time for them? Finish school, all of you. I know it gets difficult. I know you don't want to do. I have a son at NYU. I hear these stories every day. Um, he just called me and said I lost. Oh, well, he just texted me from his computer and said I lost my phone. And I'm like, how is that my problem? <laughs> The wonderful thing about 
college is you will make friends that you will have for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You will have community. You will understand how to navigate the world. You will understand how to identify who you are in a group. You will understand how you find your purpose. And most importantly, you will be exposed to things that you won't necessarily be exposed to in life if you don't have the background and the support of an education. I had to learn a lot just through trial and error and reading. And I'm, I'm a very curious person. So take advantage of this. This is a blessing in your life. And your parents have worked very hard for you to be here. I know, because I get that bill. <laughs> um, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hello. Oh, All right. So as we go back to um, what First Lady mentioned with Dr. Rich sharing with us what she would go back and tell her 18 year old self. Yeah. If you could turn back the time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you tell her? Ooh, I think I would say. Don't take life so seriously. And. The reason I say that is. My family came to this country from Trinidad. My grandmother um, and grandfather both bought property and that's how they started their legacy. My grandmother was a hairstylist. But everything around me from the time I was very young was all about work and survival. And survival breeds fear, mm -hmm. right? Like when you're in constant survival mode, you are afraid, you are fearful, which actually impedes your success. And so I think at 18, you know, my mom went to the University of Iowa. She was an art major painter. And we used to, we were the only black, um, I was the only black girl in a school with like 250 kids. And my mother was like, we going to be black and proud. And so I had this big Afro and um, I'll tell you a quick story. That's actually really funny. And then I'm going to answer your question, but you guys will appreciate the story because we love our hair as black people. Mm -hmm. we do. So we, <laughs> so I was a brownie and I was the only brown thing in the group. Everybody else was white, which is fine. And we had a trip to Supercuts. That was like our big, <laughs> Uh -oh. That was our big um, field trip. Uh -oh. <laughs> now, I'm looking at the commercials, and I'm like, I don't see anybody here that looks anything like me. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and I'll never forget, we walk into Supercuts, and we're all in a line, and we're all, like, fully in our little uniforms. And I'm kind of like, I had my big afro because my mother made sure it was loud and proud every morning. And the lady that got me was like, oh, Lord, she, her eyeballs were like this. Like, what am I going to do with this child's hair? And I was kind of like, hi, you got the black girl. <laughs> and we, um, I got my hair washed, and she didn't know what to do with my hair. And I didn't try to help her because I was like, listen, this is a field trip. <laughs> and what? <laughs> When I finished, she like blew it dry and then tried to curl it like you would do a woman with straight hair. And it was, it looked like um, a fro that had curls, <laughs> which, you know, I'm trying to think, okay, rem do, they're too young to know who Minnie Ripperton is. They know Minnie Ripperton. You know Minnie Ripperton. We've got but do you, okay, so Ripperton. you know how she would wear her hair. It was like natural, but like, uh, but you don't want that at nine or 10. <laughs> That's not the look we're going for. So, so anyway, as I'm walking out of the room, she grabs, there was a thing of flowers on the desk and they were old. I'm just going to call it what it is. The flowers had been there and she pulled off some baby flower, baby's breath, and she stuck it in my hair. And and I was like, thanks. And so when I got home, my mother was like, why would they put baby's breath? They know it breaks. It's like, so now I have a 
fro curl with baby's breath that I can't get out of my hair. I say that to say this. I felt so different, so uncomfortable, so um, alone in that moment. And I didn't feel good enough. And I felt like if this is going to be my experience and in this, in this life, I'm going to have to figure out how to love on myself. And I was a very young girl when I had to learn that lesson because I was chased home. I was called out of my name. I was teased. I was called ugly. I was called dirt. I was called all the things. And so when I came to, we left Iowa and we moved to California. We moved to South Central Los Angeles, which was a completely, it was boys in the hood. That was my life. <laughs> but the problem was, is I didn't have an accent. I wasn't from the South. I didn't, my mother did not fry chicken or make greens. She didn't know how. I learned because I was like, I'm not going to be black and not know how to fry some chicken. <laughs> but I also learned how to, to share with my friends in South Central how to create, you know, um, eat, make Caribbean food. And so it became this collective experience. I would tell my 18 year old self not to take things so serious and to enjoy the journey. Because when you're so focused on the outcome, you oftentimes forget to enjoy the joyous, the joyous moments that actually create the memories that actually keep your spirit open and light. I was on a mission to succeed because I didn't have a choice. There was no um, college fund. There was, there was no life. There was, there was nothing built in because we did not have generational wealth in my family. And so I don't say have more fun to say don't be about your business. I say while you are working hard, working towards your dreams, enjoy, have fun too. You can do both effectively. And when you have fun, what happens is you're putting this energy out into the universe that says you're open and you're joyous. And with that energy, God feels that and God goes, oh, she's open, she's ready, she's joyous. And then all of a sudden, all of these things start coming your way. When you're tight and over-focused and frustrated, you actually make your life smaller. So when it gets difficult, just remember, the difficult times are the times that you're in the valley, and those are the times when you learn, and those are the times when God is really working on you. And then, all of a sudden, life gets really light, and you start to move forward, and all these beautiful things start to come to you. So, my answer to your question is, I would never go to Supercuts, and, and I would have more fun. Very good. Hey, Nini. Hi. <laughs> That's what everyone in my family calls me. <laughs> I am Chandra Bethe, a senior communication scholar from Fort Myers, Florida. And you were speaking about being in the Valley. And I don't think I've ever shared this um, out loud. So um, last semester, I served as Miss Edward Waters University 2022. And I had to step down because my GPA went from a 275 to a 273. So in imagine um, getting the call, imagine having the conversation and then feeling isolated and then feeling not good enough and then feeling like you don't belong or that because you've lost this great honor, everyone is not proud of you anymore. So what things do you tell yourself when you have self-doubt or feel like you don't belong anymore? Well, first of all, I think it's really brave of you to share your story in that way. So you need to give yourself some love. 
And maybe you needed that time to work on self. You know, some people, uh, you have, sometimes you just get sat down and you don't want to, but you're like, no, it's time to take a break. And through those experiences, although they're painful, they help you to, I think, prioritize what really matters to you and what's important to you. And you will forever be able to tell that story as you continue to thrive. And that makes you interesting. That does not make you a failure. That actually makes you interesting. I cry with you, girl, I know. Um, listen, this industry will beat you up. I've been beat up by this industry over and over and over and over and over again. The problem is, is I'm hard-headed. I'm spicy and I'm hard-headed. So it doesn't make me go away. It just makes me figure out another loophole in the system. And I, I am, when I have those moments, well, first of all, here's the thing. I don't look for anyone outside of my home and my God and my, in, my inner circle to, t to give me my value and my self-worth. <laughs> That's, that's kind of like where you start. But when you're young, when you're young and you're still trying to figure it out, it, it's, I understand that pressure. My son is 22, he's at NYU, and he had a scholarship to play baseball. And during the pandemic, all the kids that were, like, and he was right on the bubble, like, would he get drafted? Would he, you know, would his career move forward? And you know, I know you know this with all the student athletes, it was really difficult during the pandemic. And basically, all of the kids that would have been drafted ended up coming back, which booted him out of the equation. And he felt like, mom, I've been playing baseball since I was four years old. This is all I know. And I said, well, you've accomplished more than most people have in this sport. And maybe it's just time for you to learn something else or be a different version of yourself. And now he's at NYU with a 3.5 GPA. And he's thinking about going to law school. And I'm so happy. I'm happy because he'll be able to pay his own bills. That's what makes me happy. I'm like, can you please get out of my purse? Um, so, so we have to have those moments where things aren't going the way that we want them to go. Because in those moments, like I said, that's when you're in the valley. When you're quiet, when you are tender, when you tend to be more prayerful and focused on the reality of your world versus the world that you see on your phone, that is when you have to let God do the work. Now, I don't know if everyone in here is spiritual or religious or what you believe in, but I know that we are governed by something bigger than us. And so if you trust that process, and I've been through it several several times in my life. It doesn't just happen once. It happens when you graduate college. It happens when you're in school. It happens when you have choose to get married, if you do or if you don't. It happens if you choose to have children. These are the milestones of our lives. And in those milestones, you will find moments of being completely lost. You will be lost. That is the cycle and the journey of life. And I've been lost many times. And you just have to sit quietly and trust grace. Because if you trust and you have faith and if you have grace, you come out of it and you go, I cannot even believe I was tripping off of that. <laughs> That's, I've had that conversation many times with myself as well. So trust the process and know that it's a part of your story. It's a part of what makes you great and interesting. If everything was just perfect, I don't really want to hear about your story. 
I want to see some tears. You know what I mean? Like you, there's nothing interesting about perfection because when you are, when, when, when you, there, first of all, there's no such thing as perfection, but if you self-define your life as, oh, my life is perfect. What, where are you vibrationally? I want to have my feet on the ground. I want to keep my heart open. I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to make mistakes so that I can learn. Well, you're never too old or too young to go through these. These are natural things. So don't beat yourself up and don't be so hard on yourselves. Thank you. Hi, Nia. Um, my name is Jordan Weeks, a sophomore communication scholar hailing from New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey. And yeah, <laughs> and um, my career goals, I eventually want to go to law school and enter ministry. Knowing that those are male dominated um, career fields, what advice do you have for women who want to work in a male dominated field? And what is one piece of practical advice you would give to someone starting out in the ent entertainment industry as a black woman? Mm. Well, first, let's take those titles off and just say that you want to go to law school and don't worry about the other people in the room. Just don't worry about it. Because you, I'm looking at you, and I don't say, oh, she's a black girl who wants to be a lawyer in a field of men. I look at you as an intelligent, beautiful woman. Just off top, right? So when we, you see, okay, so here's the secret. Here's the secret. We know who we are. We don't need to put the title on ourselves to walk into the room. Those days are over. Let them see who you are and what you do and keep that pride and that secret of greatness quietly to yourself. That's your, that's your superpower. We don't have to lead with that because the minute you lead with that, you are judged. Because this is still a racist country. I, well, I, this morning, very, perfect example. I took a red-eye flight. I landed into Atlanta at about 6.38. My flight left at 7.05 to come here. I was like, I'm not running. I am tired. God's going to work this out. I'm going to get there by 5. I'm not. I'm going to be good. So I get on the train and I see people sweating, like spitzing, running down the thing, the bags. One girl was crying. I said, why are you crying? She's like, I just, I just can't take it. I just need to go. I just want to get to school. And I just, I mean, and she was like boohooing. I was almost ready to say, can you just, we're going to get a car and drive here. Like that was my other thought. Like I'll just drive. I'll get a car and drive. I get to the counter. And there's one woman who happened to be white and she was standing there and we're all sort of spread out. And so I walk up to the thing and she goes, we're all waiting. I said, okay, I'm not trying to cut the line. I'm okay. just trying to ask it's a question. Right, she go, and so the woman at behind the desk says, ma'am, I'm really sorry, but um, I have another flight coming in in about eight minutes. And in my mind, I'm thinking all this talking, you could have just checked to see if I was booked on the next flight, right? And so I said, okay, no problem. I think, we're, I, think you're, I have faith that you're gonna be able to help me in eight minutes. She just kind of looked at me like, she's not going away. Nope, I'm not. Cause I'm spicy and I'm hard headed. Yes. And so I'm, I'm standing there and there's another, then a sister comes over uh -oh. and she done took her, hold on, this is her. Mm -hmm. she, got her she got her snap. And, she, and I said, come on, sis, can you help me? She goes, nope. I don't do that. I don't change flights. And besides, I'm not on for another 10 minutes. I said, well, between 10 minutes I'm not working and eight minutes another flight is coming in, I'm still not gonna give up. Because I believe that anything's possible. 
And I think some of us tend to be overly polite because we are black and we've been told that we don't deserve what everyone else deserves. And we make ourselves smaller in the room because we don't feel that we have deserved the authority to be assertive. You can be assertive and graceful. You don't have to be rude. And some of our elders will even tell you, you're being rude, go stay in your place. I'm sorry, no. We're not doing that anymore. We do not have to. It is a mindset. So when you walk in that room for, to fill out that application for law school, to fill out that application for your job, understand your power. Understand that it doesn't matter who else is in that room because if that's your purpose and you've worked hard for it, there will be space for you. And, and you can't leave us hanging. Oh, it right. The story. Let me tell you what happened with the lady at the thing. We want to know. Oh, my God. So, the, so the lady that had, the white lady that was like, we're all waiting. She's so... So she's standing over here. So the woman behind the thing says, I've got eight minutes. And I said, I'm so sorry, ma'am, but I think in eight minutes we can figure this out. Because sometimes they just rebook you on the next flight. So the lady over here, the one that said we're all waiting, looks at me and goes, yelling at her is not going to help. This is just Delta Airlines, and they are horrible. It doesn't matter. And I looked at her. I said, well, I don't believe that. I believe that she has plenty of time to check and see if I'm booked on the next flight. And I believe that it's gonna be worked out. And she's, <laughs> well, good luck. And she storms off. And the other woman who was crying, she got snot. <laughs> they both walk off. And then I go to the desk and I said, she's like, well, now I only have four minutes. I said, but we could have checked already. She checked, I was booked on the next flight. I didn't have to run. I didn't sweat my hair out. Thank you. I didn't have to cuss nobody out. I didn't, my feet weren't hurting because I wore my Jordans and I was cool. I had my little bag, no, no issues. I walked to the lounge, I waited for my flight and now I'm here. When you trust, when you have grace, when you lead with purpose, when you don't make yourself small in the room, you will find your spot. So powerful, so powerful. All right, I hear me. Okay. Hi, Ms. Neal. My name is Patricia Johnson, and I am a senior communication scholar here from the city of St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, you said something earlier that really touched, touched a chord in my heart. You said trust the process. And I'm sure your journey across the years has been long and obviously very rewarding. But what are some barrier breakers that you had to go through on your way to stardom and how did you overcome them? Well, I think, you know, when I started in the business, it was not this diverse. People weren't getting the opportunities that Issa Rae has to have her own show. Mm. People weren't getting production deals. People weren't getting opportunities. It, it was just act and get hired. We were artists for hire. So my um, journey was a lot more difficult because I, didn't, I wasn't able to do other things like, or at least I didn't think I was able to. Right. Like I had to change my mindset. And so now I'm working on a whole bunch of other things. But I also wanted to be a mother. It was really important to me to to be present for my children. And I wasn't going to be the type of mom who had like five nannies raising my kids or not being there for them while I'm off doing whatever just to have these accessories. I'm raising young men who are amazing children they're both very different one is super arty and like he's probably going to end up with like purple hair i'm sure by the time he's a teenager and the other one is like super brainy and sporty so i've got like these two 
young men who really know who they are. And I'm proud of that. And so it's, it's taking your time, right? It's taking your time. It's, it's trusting the process. It's, you know, understanding what's important to you. Because I find that anytime I try to do what I think I should do, I make a mistake. Or it's the thing that looks like the right decision. Have, have any of you felt that way? Like, oh, I'm going to do the thing that looks like the right decision because then this will probably happen. It's no, it's, it doesn't work that way. You really have to live your authentic self no matter what. No matter who's not accepting you, no matter who doesn't like you, it, it does, it's who cares? You got to feel good about you when you wake up in the morning. And so, oh, and, the, and to your question about... Um, Tips about the industry. Are there any people here that want to be in the entertainment business? You do? What do you want to do? How tall are you? Oh, yeah, you're tall. I'm 5'2 on a good day. Um, so here's what I would say. Learn everything about the industry. Don't just stay in front of the camera because you want to have other opportunities. Learn about producing. Learn about writing. Learn about being a cinematographer, which is the person who sets up the camera and holds the camera. Write your stories down. We, meet, we need more stories about black people. It could be the simplest story. The other day I heard a story about a woman who's this huge executive in business and in finance, and she lost her mother, and she turned her garage into a florist. I think that's such a beautiful story to tell. Like, we can tell those stories. White people tell these types of stories all the time. They'll be like the simplest thing, right? And we don't do that because we think we have to, to tell these stories that are like really hardcore history. Yes, those are important. But we also love. We also have very simple moments. We are also, we don't, it's, it's not just about the struggle. It's about the living. It's about the now. It's about the contemporary experience of being black. And that's sprinkled with all of it. So when you don't know what to do, write your story down because one day that story will mean something and you'll need it as your notes. So Nia, you talked a lot about mindset, uh, telling your story or sharing your story and leading with purpose. And so I asked you, as a role model for young black and brown ladies, mm. can you share how you use your platform to uplift and empower others? Well, being here hopefully inspires someone in this room. <laughs> um, you know, I teach my children to love everyone. I also teach my children to understand who they are as young black men in this country. And at the end of the day, I want to be able to say that I may change not for myself, but for us to create a beacon of light for others to follow. But I don't want to be separate from you. I want to be an extension of you. I want you to be an extension of me. And it's always been my goal as an artist to never feel, I never want anyone to feel like, I'm here and you're here and I'm a movie star and you're not. I'm not, that's not who I am. My, my father was a poet. His family was from Georgia. And I wanna read you this poem that he wrote um, that I just think is really important for us. I have to go to my Instagram to find it. <laughs> Take your time, right? We all want to hear it. Exactly. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this was written in 1971. So I was a year old. Damn, I just told y'all how old I am. <laughs> and I said a bad word. 
Do you see them all mathing real quick? They were quick? all calculating. They, 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 you smart children were trying to do the math in your head. <laughs> um, I don't care. Shoot, I'm proud. You still look good. It's beautiful. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so this is what my father wrote. My father wrote, black people have got to be black or sleep into a dying and forget that each of them is a sun god. We've got to listen. The chaos around us is deep. That was in 1971. That's still happening right now. So my point is, we are the change. It's not what's happening outside. We are the change. We are the ones who have to encourage one another and be an example for each other because the chaos isn't going anywhere. People who are ignorant and racist and foolish are going to always exist. We don't let them govern our success or the way we live our lives. And that's it. That's all. All right, so you've had a long career, both TV, movies, all this great stuff. Mm -hmm. Throughout their career, which role has been the most challenging and why? <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know if any of you guys saw this film that I did called Searching, that's out right now with Storm Reid, but that was hard to make. It was hard to make because it was a very technical film and it, it was just like, it was awkward because normally you shoot a camera's here, a camera's here, a camera's here, and you shoot it from all angles and then that's it. This particular project, we were shooting from our phones. There were like cameras that you didn't even know were like placed in certain areas. And I was like, where's my light? I need my, <laughs> you can't even see me. Um, and so I had to trust the process. So that was a difficult one for me. Um, Best Man, the series was, I, I'm really, <laughs> I love you guys so much for supporting because you know if you don't support, I don't, it don't happen for me. <laughs> uh, and that's why I'm here because it's, it's reciprocal. So um, Best Man was incredible. I'll tell you what we did as a cast. As a cast, we decided that we were worth more mm -hmm. and that we were not gonna be underpaid. And I called Sanaa Lathan and I said, we gotta do this right. Mm -hmm. She was like, all right, let's go. And we essentially came together like the black friends and we made sure that we were paid. We weren't paid like the white friends, but we were paid pretty good. <laughs> um, and it wasn't about the money, it was about the standard. It was about the fact that our films have been so incredibly successful and we are the only and first black franchise in the history of the entertainment business. Mm. And so there's a price for that, right? And I remember, so <laughs> this is really sad, but every night during the negotiation, I would finish like a half a bottle of red wine because I was so stressed out. And I'm not even a drinker. Like I'm like one champagne and somebody needs to drive me home. So by the time we started sh shooting, I was like, oh my God, I've gained 15 pounds from the red wine, stressing me out, trying to get the money. <laughs> so now, but, but it didn't matter, because I did it for us. I was like, I'll take it all, it doesn't even matter. And um, I'm really proud of myself for standing up in that way, because we were all gonna walk away if we didn't get what we thought we deserved and what we were, we stood up for ourselves and what we're worth. Um, and then the show went and broke records. So now I definitely don't feel bad, you know? 
And then one of my favorite characters to date, I mean, I love, I've played so many incredible women, but um, Nina, of course, from Love Jones. I mean, I just saw Lorenz Tate. Oh my God, you're too cute back there. Um, I just saw Lorenz Tate. We had, we had dinner about, was it a month ago? We had dinner. I love him so much. And we are, <laughs> <laughs> and we are desperately trying to find something to work on with one another. And we've held out because we want to make sure that when we do it, that you guys are not disappointed. So stay tuned. Well, I think you definitely have at least one. Yeah. That's going to come support. Firm support. Firm support. I mean, one ticket for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, my dear. What is your name? Shatina Rogers. Yes, baby. It, listen, if it wasn't for your love and support, it wouldn't be an iconic cult classic, so thank you. My most favorite character to play to date is Miss Peggy from Roxanne, Roxanne. And the reason I loved, how many of you have seen that movie? Okay, so the rest of you need to go watch it tonight on Netflix. <laughs> It is the story of a single mother raising four girls in the projects in, um, in New York City, in Queens. And when I read the script, I was like, this woman embodies the black, the experience of black women. Even if you dropped a husband in there, it's still the experience of black women. And so for me, it was a moment to say how much I appreciate my elders and what they have been through for us. And to represent, my mother was a single mother. Every woman in my family at some point has been a single mother. Um, and I just think when we can look at someone else's experience, it eases the pain, right? It eases the pain because you know you're not alone. So I encourage you all to see that film. It's a, it's a story about Roxanne Roxanne, who's a rapper in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. And she actually has her own radio show now. And um, she had an iconic song, Roxanne Roxanne. I want to be your man. Hey, Roxanne, Roxanne. So you guys go watch it. It's a great film, but I love Miss Peggy. Miss Peggy was not the nicest woman, but Miss Peggy got the job done. All right. Hello? Hello? Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Tanaj. I'm a junior communication scholar from Chateau. Hey, love Jones. Oh, so you scream for everything else. There we go. <laughs> Um, my question is, I am a model right now. I signed with the agency in Orlando. I've walked in LA Fashion Week, but my hardest thing right now is to get paid. You were talking about money, money, money. And I feel like when the money comes around, um, well, the money is not coming around, but the, the drive is, the hustle is. So my question to you is, how did you get paid? When did it all start? Like, when did you was like, okay, I'm going to take this route and I'm going to find this place and I'm going I'm to end up making the money for it? So you don't get paid for a long time. I know, right? <laughs> but that's the life of an artist. I remember when my first job was, um, oh my gosh, The Guiding Light. Ooh. And I remember, I used to pray for two things when I was a little girl. I used to play, pray, pray for patience and grace. 
And the patience was because I knew that I was going to be an actress and the grace was so that I wouldn't, my heart would stay soft, you know, that I would be able to still love what I do when the opportunity came. And I remember, um, so I, and then I said a prayer. I said, okay, I, cause I graduated high school early at a really high GPA. I went to a junior college just so that I wasn't doing nothing. I finished two years at a junior college. And then I, cause I was in high school taking college courses. Like I was, I don't even know why I was doing that. That's when I needed to have more fun. That's my point. I was like trying to do all the things at one time. Um, but my point is, is I, I, I said to God, I said, God, when I graduate from college, I mean, from high school, if I don't get a job within the first six months, I'm going to go and get my degree and finish school. Well, before I even graduated from high school, I got this job. And it was back in New York. And I remember that I was making $1,500 every two weeks. And my rent was $2,000 a month or $2,500. And my agent was like, listen, your first check out of the month should pay for all of your expenses. And then you should be able to save one check and, or save two checks and have fun with one check. I was like, well, this math is definitely not working. <laughs> so I would eat a slice of pizza every day for dinner, I, like every day. I would eat at work so I wouldn't have to spend money on food. And then if I was hungry in the evening, I would have sliced pizza. And then I knew a lot of like, that was during the time of like when Puffy was giving all of his parties in New York and we would go to his parties and there would just be guys there like paying for everything. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> um, that's fine, cause I'm broke. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, it takes time to get paid. And, and as the, the generations move forward, they actually pay more, right? So like when I first started, that was like not a lot of money to be on a show every week and like move to New York, which is a really expensive city. What I would say is you got to diversify your portfolio, right? Unless you're Naomi Campbell, the modeling thing, you're not going to make that kind of money on that. You're, it's, you got to be practical, right? Like do it and enjoy it, but then know when to stop and move on to something else. So if, if acting is what you really want to do, start taking classes, start doing like a commercial workshop because that's where you make good money. If you get one commercial, it runs over and over and over again, you can make pretty good money. It's, if the goal is to be famous, you will fail. That can't be the goal. The goal has to be, I love what I do and I'm an artist and I have a voice that needs to speak into this platform. And when you have that intention, you will then seek other things to fill in and to make money. Because the money don't make you, you make the money. All right. If if the goal is to be famous, then you will fail. All right, that's a nugget. Now, we have a uh, vast audience, and I believe in my heart of hearts that there's probably one or two questions perhaps <laughs> simmering in the seats. So I'm going to ask if we could prepare for audience Q&A. We'll take just a couple of questions to the mic, and I'm being directed to uh, the mic that is at the dais. So as you make your way, would you oblige me in some fast answer, yes, rapid quick. fire Rapid questions. fire One answers. Word. Are you ready? Yes, right. let's do it. Here we go. What are you currently reading? 
Oh, I am reading uh, Viola Davis's um, book. Have you guys read it? It's yes, so it's good. good. I started reading that, and then I'm also, I started reading, <laughs> I started this reading this book about organizing because mm. I just moved into a new house. So mm -hmm. I've been just kind of, yeah. All right. Oh, that's okay. She, she's made her way. Hi, I'm Dr. Eurydice Stanley. I'm the co-author of The Worst First Day, Bullied While Desegregating Central High, the autobiography of Elizabeth Eckford of the Little Rock Nine. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so we tell her story, and it is true history. And I don't know if you're aware of what's happening right now in Florida and the efforts through HB 999 to eradicate history, but I'm just wondering, as someone who presents history through mm. your art and the craft, why is it important? I know why I feel that it's important, but why do you think that it is important for our youth, and not just our youth, for anyone to know history and hide it within their hearts? Well, I think our history gives us a sense of security because you're attached to something and you're an extension of something. And there have been moments in my life where I've had to restudy our history because it's not readily available for us, right? And that's purposeful. That is done purposely. Um, and so young people, you won't truly understand those moments in the valley if you don't understand your history mm -hmm. because it's all an extension of that. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. As the next one makes their way to the podium, Rapid Fire, please tell us, what is your favorite late night snack? Oh my God, I have so many. <laughs> I love plain M&Ms. I love ice cream. I love chips. I love quesadillas. I love Mexican food. Like I, could, I make really good Mexican food too. Thank you. I, I like all snacks. Thank you. Hi, I would like to ask. Hi, I would like to ask. What is something to keep in mind when acting? Like to tell yourself to make sure that you do what you're. Supposed While I'm doing it, what should I keep? What? What should you keep in mind? Well, what I keep in mind is pretend like the camera's not there because then you can be natural. And what I want you to keep in mind is you're a beautiful brown girl and you can do whatever you want to do. My daughter. Her name is Victoria. Um, she is currently in middle school. And I brought her to have the experience. I'm an alumni from here, of course. Yes. And when I was here, um, my major is criminal justice, and I'm in law enforcement. But Winnie Mandela was here. Oh, wow. And that was my experience. So I wanted her to have a great experience. So when I saw, we had to come. That's amazing. You're a good mama. And that's what I mean about being an, ex an example, right? You're, you're passing on to your children. You're present for her. You are teaching her that in her generation, there are, the, there are great people that she can look up to. Like we, We've got to keep doing that. That's what gives us grace. That's what gives us strength and power and understanding and the ability to... to to know that we're bigger than what they've ever said we could be and who we are. And I tell everyone, her age, her voice is her power. That's they right. have to learn to use it. Yes. Because if they don't, they'll keep being oppressed. It's, no, right. it's not right. So. My 11-year-old is, uh, he, he's an amazing person because I don't even know how he has this amount of confidence but um, he's, uh, he'll act like he's shy. But you know, you know that time when you let your child go into the store by themselves for the first time? And you're like in the car like, <laughs> they make sure they don't steal my baby in there. But they come back with exactly what you asked them to come back and they paid and they got the receipt and they got the change. That's when you know you're doing the right thing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Waydell. I'm a business administration major and a senior. I'm also an international student from the Bahamas. 
Oh, and, nice. <laughs> thank you. And I aspire one day to be a fashion stylist. I love Absolutely. your outfit. I was just saying, thank that's you. a really cute thank top. You. Maybe I'll borrow that. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to have my own fashion brand one day. But um, as an international student, you're saying you're also from Trinidad. How did you break the barriers of um, comparison? Because I know the industry is very competitive. And how did you have confidence? I just didn't compare myself to anyone. You know, I, I honestly was, I was like, I hate to be slightly selfish, but I'm going to mind my business. And, and some people won't like you for that because they'll think you have a chip on your shoulder or you're being stuck up, but it's really not that. It was, it was a combination of desperation, fear, and um, knowing that I could and that I was good at it, but the fear is the thing that kept me kind of to myself. And I don't think we should be driven by fear, right? Like I think recognize that and go, okay, this scares me, that means I have to do it. So just keep doing the thing that makes you feel good your way and then learn from the greats and then put your plan together and, and execute your plan. Don't worry about how this person did it or that person did it. You can learn from them, but you don't have to try to emulate them, you know? And I, I think that's the best way to go, yeah. Hi. Hi, Tiger family. Hi, Nia. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Asule. I am a senior here. I am in psychology, soon to be graduating. So um, my question is... Congratulations. Thank you. My question is, what was the definitive moment for you to say... I know you say you went to college before you ended up stopped going. So what was the definitive moment for you to say that I'm no longer going to go by what society says and I'm going to go by what God says? Like, So you just took a dive into what your purpose was. Um, I don't think I consciously ever did it any other way because see my grandmother didn't play that she was like no Nini we're gonna do this <laughs> and she was so graceful and so strong and such an example in my life that she gave me the confidence to just be it be to be to be the thing that I saw myself to be. Right. Um, but when I knew I was on to something, see, God speaks to me in my dreams. I don't know. Does anyone else have that? Isn't it amazing? It is the most amazing thing that happens. So if I'm thinking about something and I pray and I go, uh, I really need some clarity on this. So I'll tell you about my dream real quick. My dream was that I was in this white, it looked like a mall, but it wasn't a mall. And there was this huge glass escalator. And it kept going up and up and up and up. And while I was on it, everyone around me was famous. I wasn't. And then I started eating bacon. <laughs> And the funny thing is I was raised a vegetarian, so I was like, uh-uh. Like the record scratch, you know? I was like, what's <laughs> happening? So I looked up the meaning of eating bacon in a dream book, and it says you are on your path to success. Amen. I was 17 years old when I had that dream. Recently, I had the same dream of the escalator, but now I was famous, and I was going up and up and up with my friends. And so I know that that means this is the next phase of my career. So trust those dreams and ask for those dreams. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bacon, can you imagine? My mother was having a heart attack. We don't eat bacon. We are vegetarians. Little did she know I was like sneaking to McDonald's having burgers. Hi, Nia. Hi. I'm Leah. Hi, Leah. <laughs> um, I just graduated from Howard University. Oh, my mom went to Howard. Congratulations. 
H U. Okay. Um, but currently, I am studying film at Columbia University. Good for I'm getting you. my MFA in producing. Yeah. That's and amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to tell black stories. Like that's what I'm committed to. But I constantly run into, you know, of course I'm at Columbia. There are white professors, white. You know, the world is white. We all know that. Yeah. Um, and I'm just trying to stay confident in telling Black stories and, like, staying committed to it. And I'm just wondering if you could give me some advice as a producer yourself about, you know, staying committed to that. Okay, so with all due respect to your professors, some of them have stopped dreaming. And they stopped dreaming to teach, which is a huge thing. I think teaching is, I'm not saying you stop dreaming to teach. What I am saying is there are, are some, there are, there are le educational leaders that choose to do that because that is their job and that is their mission and that is their purpose. There are others that wanna be famous and fall back on teaching because it's like, oh, well, I get good benefits and I know enough and like, I'm being real. That's the truth. Don't let, you don't know what your professor's going through. Who cares what he thinks? Okay, the grade is going to be the grade. As long as you do the work, he can't not give you the good grade. His opinion doesn't really matter. His opinion doesn't really matter, right? So just don't try to write what you already see. Write what you already know. And when you write what you know, no one can take that away from you. And who cares what the, my son had a professor that was like, I, I actually sat in, cause I was like, what am I paying for? <laughs> and I actually sat, sat in on the Zoom and the professor was so judgmental of the students. I He's not even giving them a chance to have a voice. Mm -hmm. It felt very much like he was this, and I'm not saying all professors are this way, but my son was actually having a problem in that class. And I said, I'm not gonna say what I said because we're in a church <laughs> setting. Thank you. But I was basically <laughs> like, no, we're not gonna listen to him. Do your work, take your test, show up, it doesn't matter what his opinion is, just do the work. Just get through it. Because you need those experiences to make you tough. You gotta be tough in this industry. You gotta be, you gotta be fearless and tough. And you'll do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story. I was supposed to be working from home a couple of months ago, and I had the Drew Barrymore show on, oh. and there you were. And so you were telling this story about how you'd auditioned for Charlie's Angels, and the feedback that you got was that your eyebrows didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. I looked what too sophisticated happen? for Drew. And so, but the, the twist of it to me was, I appreciate you telling your story, but to hear her say, I had no idea. And you were like, it was your production company. Right. And so to hear you say that and to be able to, to move forward with that, my question is when situations happen like that, where there's no reason for it, right? There's no reason for why you were not selected. Did you have a support system that you could go to to say, y'all, you know what just happened to me. And they would understand and you all would support each other, a sisterhood, a brotherhood, a family. Who was there to kind of hold you up when those types of injustices happened? Nobody. I mean, my mother's always there, but it, it's she's my mama, so she's gonna always be there no matter what. But I didn't, first of all, I honestly don't think Drew knew. And I'm gonna tell you why, because She's the superstar in her company. She's got probably 25 other people, at least one other really strong producing partner. But I don't even think it came from Drew. I think it came from the studio. Because what you have to understand is during that time, they were saying, we want to diversify everything. We want to see more black women. So they would bring us in and never hire us. Ever. And there was no intention. 
There was no intention to hire us. It, they never, they knew they weren't, but when they, when I walked in the room, so they had to come up with these excuses as to why it didn't work. Now, when I saw the film, I was like, Lucy Liu was the right choice. Like she was great in that movie, but it didn't mean that I wouldn't have been great. Mm -hmm. It just meant that, okay, that worked mm -hmm. onward. I don't know that I want to be doing all that flipping and flopping and be <laughs> wearing a size two. That's too much stress. They were all like, this big, I was like, no. Um, <laughs> but I loved that Drew was fearless enough to bring it up mm -hmm. because we're of the same generation. And sometimes white women are just not aware of the reality of what we go through. Mm -hmm. And so that was that conversation. That's what that conversation meant to me. They, they don't know because it's not their problem. Sure. That's how the world operates. They're, you know... Oh my God, really? Yes, really. Yeah. It's been happening. Yeah. Thank you so much. I You're just welcome. want to give a shout out to my support system at work. They like, cause we, in, we work in an industry where like, we're like little chocolate chips in the dough. Where do you work? What kind of work do you do? <laughs> you guys are filming. We, we're in the banking industry, I was saying. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, and so we have those days where it's just like, it happened again. And we just hold each other up and so we can make it through another day so that we can get to the point where we can start breaking those glass ceilings and making sure that we can take the hit so people who come in after us, they don't have to do that. That's amazing. And so that's what you've done for other people that have come through the Kiki Palmers, all these young women who are coming through, because it goes to people like you. Thank <laughs> you, Yvonne. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your questions. Our last question this evening is going to come from Kimberly. I love your necklace. It's so pretty. Thank you. So I am Kimberly Holland, a freshman business administration scholar from Baltimore, Maryland. Hey. And I noticed that Miss Roshana Newman mentioned that you are a three-time award winner of the National uh, Association of, for the Advancement of Colored People Award. And uh, as students of Florida's destination institution, there are some very controversial, as someone mentioned before, there are some very controversial bills that we are facing right now. And I was wondering, as students, what do you think are some tactics that we can use to prevent things like this from happening in the future? Well, you have to get organized first and send the message um, that, and I'm not totally 100% what's on the political ticket right now, um, but I mean, I can only imagine if it's about erasing history and, and making that, um, what, what exactly, if you had to summarize what's happening right now, what would you say? a ban of programs that include uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, that's not okay. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> well, I mean, what, what, what would you do? What would you do? How, how do we do, I don't, cause I, I don't live here, so I don't really know. Well, voting for sure. Okay, well, y'all need to go talk to her. <laughs> because she seems like Coretta Scott King back there, ready to... I mean... <laughs> well, that's what I mean when I say get organized, right? Like, get organized about what's important to you and have these conversations and have town hall meetings and have prayer groups. and ha it's, it's about community. You know, when, when um, and some of you may not agree with my views, but when women lost the power to choose, mm. I was not okay with that. Mm. I wasn't okay with us losing the power to choose. I think you can be pro-life, but also pro-choice. And so 
we have to just start having the conversations in a real way and get organized. So what's your name, young lady? Stand up, Kiara. Come, can you come up here, please? I just want her. Okay, she's, she's ready with the cute walk and the black dress and the cute shoes <laughs> and the good hair. Tell us about what you do. Thank you so much, Nia Long. You're so, so welcome. My name is Kira Nixon. I'm a community advocate here in Jacksonville, Florida. I am a former Miss Black Florida and a graduate of Florida A&M University. Hey. <laughs> and in my meantime, I do government relations for my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> And I serve as the government relations chair for Florida A&M University local alumni chapter. Okay, so here's your leader. <laughs> I think you should stand at the back of the room with a, yes. with a bowl and okay. everyone should drop their numbers and emails Absolutely. and you should send out a community email Absolutely. and y'all should start talking. There it is. And before I leave, we are in election season right now here in Jacksonville. Early voting ends on Sunday. And the general election is this Tuesday. Please vote. Y'all need to vote. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, we just got schooled. <laughs> there is nothing indeed like the spirit of the HBCU to be reminded to vote. So I want to, from the top of my heart, <laughs> not the bottom, because if I started from the bottom, there'd be nothing left. <laughs> I want to thank you, and I want to also invite our president, Dr. A. Zachary Faison, Jr., to the podium for final remarks. <laughs> Good evening, good evening, good evening. I wanted to make sure I got here before <laughs> this auspicious evening was over. So welcome, 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 Ms. Long, thank you. Have you all enjoyed it? Y'all enjoyed it? Well, y'all can do better than that. Stand up on your feet, come on now. And so, Ms. Long, on behalf of the Edward Waters University Board of Trustees, uh, myself as president, all of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni, we want to present you with a gift. And thank you so very much. So that as, as you take that with you, uh, you will be able to say that you have visited uh, the state of Florida's, that's right, the state of Florida's first historically black college or university. We certainly love our sister institutions at Florida A&M and Howard, but there's only one. There's only one. There's only one. The first historically black college or university in the state of Florida. Florida's destination institution of emerging eminence here at Edward Waters University. So we are so, so very excited and so delighted that you were able to join us this, this evening. Can we give this august, beautiful, brilliant panel of black women leaders that moderated our discussion this evening? I want to thank all of our students. You all look so resplendent, so radiant this evening. Certainly uh, to the first uh, African-American woman leader of the athletics department here at Edward Waters University, Dr. Ivana Rich. Our SGA president, Ms. Patricia Johnson, we want to thank you. I think I saw earlier our Miss and Mr. Edward Waters University were here. I want to acknowledge them. And as I always say, the very best part of me, the first lady of Edward Waters University, Mrs. Ticey Lorraine Faison. Thank you so very much. Well, again, I would not be a president if I did not ask you to do one thing before you leave. This house is packed. You've come out and had an opportunity to enjoy uh, what Edward Waters University has brought to this community. But it's about giving back, right? We want to keep these kinds of events 
and these kinds of uh, 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 community kinds of opportunities for us to engage, we want to keep that going. So I need you to take out your cell phone. I need you to go to www.ew.edu. Come on, I need you to do that right now. Come on, take it out. I need you to go, and there are about three buttons on the right-hand side. If you click those three buttons, then it's going to say, give to EWU now. All right? So you can make a gift today to support the young people and support these kinds of programs that we bring to our students and to our community, okay? So we thank you again for being here this evening. Thank you so very much again for gracing us with your presence, Ms. Long. Let's give her one more round of applause. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. I am inspired by all of you and stay black and stay proud and stay beautiful. Thank you. With that, good night. Thank you all. <laughs>